commentary head, I mean the lectionary head for this week. Starting uh, chapter 17, verse 22. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will take a shoot from the very top of the cedar and plant it. I will break off a tender sprig from its topmost shoots and plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. It will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it, and they will find shelter in the shade of its branches. All the trees of the forest will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and make the low tree grow tall. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. Okay. So, in a nutshell, Ezekiel, let's see, Ezekiel, uh, Daniel, and Jeremiah, they were all contemporaries. They were all prophets during the same, around the same time. This was when Babylonian was pretty much having its way with uh, that part of the world. Um, they remember that David had unified the kingdom. And in the north, you had which kingdom? Is anybody, when they split, anybody remember? In the north, you had Israel. And in the south, you had Judah. Okay? North, you had Israel, south, Judah. Well, by the time all of this happened, or by the time Babylon is, I think it was Babylon that actually, no, it was the Syrians who took out Israel in the north. And then in the south, uh, Babylon attacks the south, Judah, three times. In one of those trips that they went down there, they took out Daniel and Ezekiel. They were over in Babylon being raised. However, Jeremiah was still back there in Judah. He was prophesying to the people that, guess what, things are not going to turn out well. Uh, this is, you know, and you're going to be conquered and destroyed. This country, I mean, this country, yes, Judah is going to be destroyed as well. Ezekiel and Daniel, they were over there in Babylon. And so the practice of the conquerors at that time was to take the people out, take them or, you know, to another, to their country. But they took your best and your brightest um, young people. And you indoctrinated them into the ways of your country. You see. You take, think about it. You take, you, you, you want to conquer a people. So you take your smartest kids. And you bring them in. And you teach them your ways. That's the reason why Daniel and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's why they were getting into trouble. Because they had been pulled in. And they were trying to indoctrinate them into their gods and their ways and all this stuff. And the big issue in the book of Daniel, one of the big issues, is that there is Daniel knowing who he is and whose he's in. Who, who he is and I'm not going to try that other one. Whose he is. <laughs> and then they're wanting him to put that aside for their God. You see. Not unlike these days. Drug dealers, think about it. Sure, they'll go after the kids that, you know, are lost, but they also want the best and the brightest. They want to mess up the futures of many kids. You, you think about that evil, where they come after our children. You think about some of this stuff that's out there online, and, 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 and they want to they want to indoctrinate the ones that they can. That, that you take your kids and you, you spend all this time, I'm off subject here, but maybe they'll kill in all the five minutes and I can get out of here without going back to Ezekiel. But you think about these days and times, and you take your children and you got them in Sunday school, or you're trying to teach them the word, or you're trying to say, this is the way we live, this is how we live, this is our, um, this is what we do. You have a moral code for your family. And then they go off to college. And at college, the teachers trash Christianity. They trash the faith. And it does happen. Trust me, I, I know from me, I was university, I was tenured faculty, university, for 10 years. I know this to be true. The kids would come in, you could talk about Buddha, you could talk about everybody else. But don't talk about Christianity. 
Christianity. Professors didn't want to hear it. I'm dealing with professors that are telling me they're practicing witchcraft and blah, blah, blah. I mean, this isn't stuff I'm making up just to, you know, this, this is the truth. This is the reason why you have to pray over your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. You seal them in the Holy Spirit because there is nothing new under the sun. What Babylon was doing is no different than what's happening in the world now. So that they know who they are and who they belong to and what they're about. You need to pray protection into their lives. So there we are. We got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We've got Daniel, great prophet. And we've got Ezekiel. And Ezekiel was seeing these things. Ezekiel was the son of a priest. He's seeing these things and he's prophesying. And he's telling the people that God was upset with them. Why? Because of idolatry. Their idolatry was so intense that they actually were sacrificing their own kids to be like the other Canaanites. That's how bad it was. That these people had turned away from God. Again and again and again. When I was in Israel, um, whenever that was, 2022, and I'm talking to our guy who happened to be Jewish, and he said, well, you know, I'm not a practicing Jew. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I hope this tour bus makes it where it needs to go. <laughs> um, because I'm thinking, when will you learn? Israel has more proportions of the population, more atheists than any other country in size. They're still turning away from God. I'm not saying that, oh yeah, something terrible is going to happen to Israel. But what I'm saying is, if you believe that the words of the Bible are true, this is a continuation of what has happening, been happening for thousands of years. God redeems them, brings them back. First thing they do is turn away from God. Turn away from God. Turn away from God. Turn away from God. You, 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 you think about this. You worry about this. That's not, and, 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 at least I do. Because I know that God is not, is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. That if he says that these things were our soul, these things will come to pass, I believe they will come to pass. And I worry about things like Armageddon and stuff like that because I sit up and I watch people with nuclear weapons just act as if we're playing with paint guns. We as Christians, we have, I don't want to get into dispensationalism and all that crazy stuff, but I mean not crazy stuff, but stuff. But I do, I do, I am concerned because I want my children, my grandchildren to survive. I want them to live long lives. But this world is so chaotic. And again, I will say, there's nothing new under the sun. So these people were practicing idolatry. And they didn't pay any attention to what Ezekiel was saying. And they sure didn't like Jeremiah. You know, he found himself in the bottom of a dry well. They had false prophets that were going up tickling their ears, just like Paul talks about in Timothy, telling them what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. False prophets. And if things were not bad enough, let me tell you how bad they were. Back then during the time of Ezekiel, they started playing politics. Oh, shoot me in the eye for politics, okay? <laughs> Just kill me now. Just kill me. Politics. They were already under the thumb of Babylon. So then they started, and God said, hey, Babylon is there to exert or to, to put into force my wrath against you for practices of idolatry. So then they started negotiating with Egypt, but it was a big mess because they did not want to accept what God was doing to them. And then when they start talking about, you know, the politics of why they're doing this, I couldn't help but think about the politics that we find ourselves engaged in in this country. I think around that same time, I found out that there was, I think I heard someplace that in one of the states out of the 50, I don't know which one, and I don't want to know which one, that they have voted that they will put the Ten Commandments um, everywhere in public places. Sure. Uh, 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 yes, we will. Is that the place that also sells all the liquor on Sundays? 
that they have in the, no, that's Washington State, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> Here's the interesting thing. Now, these are public places. Public places that have been paid for by the taxes of all the people of the state. That means not just the Christians pay taxes for the public places, but also the Muslims, the Baha'is, the Buddhists, the Jews. Well, they may not have a problem with the Ten Commandments. Buddhists, the Baha'i, uh, the uh, all Confucius, you name it. But they all are supposed to get excited about the Ten Commandments. And, and I don't know what the outcome, what the outcome they're expecting. If anybody knows the outcome they're expecting, please share that with me. Because here's the thing. Why do we continue to expect people in the world to behave like people in the church? They are people in the world. The Ten Commandments means nothing to them. Why do you want to put that out there? You know, oh, yeah, oh, wow, I never thought of that. I shouldn't kill anybody. Do you really think they pay any attention to that? We are supposed to have been transformed. We are new creatures. All things have passed away and all things have become new. But instead, we're expecting these people who have never accepted Christ to behave like they have accepted Christ. That's the point. I didn't see anything in my Bible, even in Ezekiel. <laughs> that said, they would. That said that we are not to leave, we are to leave them with legislation. I seem to remember Jesus talking along the lines of love. We are to lead with love. Nothing about going, I seem to remember Jesus saying something about give Caesar Caesar's due. But I don't remember him suggesting that we make people take communion. We make people do what we and our hearts are doing because we love God. That's not what we're supposed to do. But somehow we've gotten so off base that somehow, I think quite frankly, we're freaking lazy. Take ten, take ten Christians asking what the Ten Commandments are. They can't tell you. They make one too. But thou shalt not kill thou something, something, something. Maybe it's a cheat sheet for them. Maybe they didn't know what the Ten Commandments were, so they had to post them. People, let's be real. If we, if we, Jesus, left us here with the power of the Holy Spirit to change the world, let's do it. And I mean, you know, it's not easy. I'm not going to stand up here and say it is. I remember uh, not too long ago, I was, when I was in Tennessee, this young guy, that's what got me, he was so young. And I was in a laundromat because my dryer had broken. I was over there drying my clothes. And he just refused to let me put my clothes on a uh, folding chain table. I didn't realize, so I really took a look at him that he was skinny. He's full of, I could just see the hate in him. He just hated me. Hadn't done anything to him, blah, blah, blah. Well, anything I knew to do was call Virgil. I said, Virgil, I need you to come over here. He was telling me all this stuff. He just hated me. You're not going to win these people over with legislation. I've been in situations, other situations, where, you know, why? Down in Arizona, and I worked at a college. Uh, here, let's stay in because I'm, I'm getting short. I worked at a college, Cochise College, right on the border. And the animosity and the intolerance for people that came across the border. They said, we don't practice Halloween anymore because we have 30 and 40 year old people standing out there saying trick or treat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Jen. <laughs> but then, when I went over to Aguaporache, went across the line, and I saw the condition. 
Christians over there. And I remember even at one point there had been a huge, pop, huge pile of Chrysotile asbestos that somebody had just dumped over there. Probably from the States, but we don't know for sure. And someone asked me to, when I was in Texas, if I would speak out on uh, the kids being in uh, the border in cages. I'm not sure. Before, the, before I did my talk, <laughs> Nina, they start sending me notes telling me they were going to kill me. Then I got scared and told her. Because <laughs> uh, they said that they were going to call ICE on me and all these people I was trying to defend. And really, I wasn't trying to defend the people. All I simply said is, I said, you know, when I got, finally got to the park, I mean, I didn't have, you know, any kind of protection or anything. But when I got to the park, I said, what, what I talked about was, I said, America is such an incredibly great, powerful, intelligent country. I said, I, we can do whatever we want to do about anything. Why can't we figure out how to solve this problem? This is a problem. This is a problem for the world. When they talk about electing a president, they talk about electing a president of the world. Not just a president, because every country in the world is impacted. Uh, whoever sits in what in the White House. Why can't we figure out how to solve these problems, to stop these people, to find out what is the problem in your own country that you can't stay there? That you're coming here in these droves and these crowds you've decided to crash the border. No, we can't take care of everybody. But at the same token, at the same time, the demographers are saying that, hey, guess what? In less than 20 years, since we're not having enough kids to meet our own manpower needs, we're going to have to depend on these people coming in from other places. We've got to learn how to get along with our world. This is who God has, this is who God has given us to minister to. No, we can't afford the luxury of, of, of listening to false prophets. We have to listen to the truth of God's word. We know in our heart, in our heart of hearts, that those children have not been in cages. But I'm not pointing fingers because I always try to err on the side. Sometimes people are doing the best they know how to do, given the situation. I'm not going to condemn anybody. That's not my job. But at the same time, too, I don't want my granddaughter in a cage. And I don't want any of you to be victimized or hurt by somebody that came across the border. Oh, that's right. All the criminals come across the border. You know. <laughs> We've got a few that are homegrown. I don't want anybody in here hurt for any reason. You know, these are God-sized problems. That's the reason why I said we need to pray. These aren't simple problems. These are huge problems. That's going to determine, to determine where this world goes next. And God has put it in your hands. Try to pray or go it all. Let us pray. Father in heaven, the one who protects us from seen and unseen dangers. The one who knows how many babies are crying because they have nothing to eat. The one who knows that you are indeed the source of all things good. All good and perfect things come from you. Lord, I ask you to tell us the action that we should take to please you and to help our brothers and sisters. At this time, we'll open the doors of the church. If anybody wants to become a